is. Tarp. That's the nothing personal word of the day. It is Wednesday, September 27th, 2023. And we're starting with what's going on in New York City. As you may remember, 48 hours, 48 miles over the weekend, tropical storm, chafing, soreness, despondency, prunishness, prunishness. Well, the other thing that was going on is there's an open air stadium in Queens called City Field. The Mets were playing in Philadelphia over the weekend and the Marlins were coming to New York to start a series yesterday. When your team is out of town, your grounds crew is still on the clock. The grounds crew works inside a stadium every day. There is a schedule. It's like being a doctor. There's people on call in case there's a storm, in case there's rain, in case there's sun, in case there's fire, rain, something. Well, during the tropical storm, the Mets did not take care of their field properly. They ended up not tarping the field and then tarping the field when it was too late. We have classes for our grounds crew. We even did it when we had a roof, but certainly a pro player. Good old Alan Sigwart would never allow what happened in New York to happen in Florida. The field was unplayable. The game between the Mets and the Marlins with huge playoff implications was postponed causing a doubleheader to be played today with the Marlins only a half game back of a playoff spot. I was immediately brought back to being president of a team. I've been on the road many times sitting through rain delays, going into the other team's dugout, going to see the other team's president, going to see the grounds crew of the other team, going to see other team's manager, going to see the umpires, talking to the commissioner's office, thinking to myself, we're being taken advantage of. The Atlanta Braves were prime at doing that. They would say, oh, we've got a window right now. Get your guy going. Oh, sorry, the window closed. Oh, don't worry. We're going to start any minute now. 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m. Absurdity, the way the Braves used to deal with rain delays. I'm not going to say that we didn't take advantage ourselves from time to time at Pro Player Stadium. Can't do it with the roof, but back in the day with no roof, we would have an advantage because we had a direct connect to the weather station in Miami. Not that I got every weather call I've ever made correct. However, there is some gamesmanship. Is it possible that the Mets screwed around with the Marlins, remembering what the Marlins did to the Mets back in 2007, et cetera, and wanted to do a little payback? No. Is it possible that Steve Cohn, as much as my dream would be for this to be the case, that he called down to his grounds crew while the team was in Philly and said, gentlemen, work your magic. Make that field as crappy as possible. No. Is it possible that during the weekend, when they wanted to put the tarp back on because the tropical storm never moved, it took a big right over us the entire weekend? Is it possible that the grounds crew tried to make up for its mistake, but realized, correctly so, because it's the it's the eighth lesson in tarp application, you cannot tarp a wet field. Have you ever gotten bagels that are really hot? And you put the bagels in a plastic bag and you close the plastic bag and then there's condensation in the plastic bag and then the bagels get wet and stay wet and get soggy. It's pretty well known that with hot bagels, if you're gonna put them away, you put them in the plastic bag and leave it open so air can get in so it doesn't get condensation wet and soggy. Sort of the same thing. Have you ever tried to put a raincoat away underneath something? and think that that will dry, you can't put a tarp over a wet field. The field won't dry ever, and then it'll get totally muddy and soggy and screwy. But that's what the Mets did. They tarped a wet field. Then when they de-tarped it, they realized, uh-oh, we have a problem. 
So they called a bit of a rain delay. They brought dryers out of the field, fans, dryers, all sorts of things, stuff that you put in your budget under capital expenses, stuff that you don't use, that's subject to get stolen if it were in Chicago. Call back. And then when it's time to use it, you realize that it was a token purchase. And that dryers on a field, it's for like a wet spot if someone has a Gatorade shower or some sort of unfortunate bowel problem that you can dry a little area. You can't dry the whole infield with the number of dryers that you buy that you have in stock. And it's not like you go to, where would you go? Whole Foods, Home Depot to get dryers? So they try to dry the field, delay, 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 postponement. I'm on the phone to the commissioner's office saying, I'm not playing a double header. Make, let us play Monday. Let us play Monday. We'll come back from Pittsburgh. Make the Mets play Monday if we need this game. Because we have no pitching. Perez is hurt. Sandy's hurt. Cueto stinks. Tanner Scott's on paternity leave. Don't get me started. Now, the Marlins trying to make the playoffs for the first time since 2003, not counting the COVID shortened sprint of 2020. They have the advantage in every tiebreaker category. All they have to do is tie the Cubs or the Diamondbacks. That's it. Or the Reds. They're going with Braxton Garrett. Hey, Derek, Braxton Garrett, draft pick of these people here. Hell yeah, 2016. But I know that we didn't leave you anything. No, I'm just kidding. No, no, we did actually draft him. He's their best remaining starter. Lefty, six inning guy. They've got 18 innings to cover today because baseball said to the Marlins, I always felt like we didn't get respect. It always bothered me. But baseball said, nope, you're doing a doubleheader. Good luck. We'll start at 410 though. So they're going to have to do a Braxton Garrett game, a bullpen game, and then figure out their pitching. And then for Sunday, Braxton Garrett, if they needed a win in the last day of the regular season, which is possible, they had Braxton Garrett, their best remaining starter on regular rest. Now he's going to have to go on short rest. And for those of you wondering whether you pitch a pitcher on short rest, yes is the answer. If you have a chance to get into the playoffs, you don't worry about game one of the wild card series. You don't worry about anything but getting to the playoffs. Braxton Garrett will start Sunday against the Pirates if that game is needed for the Marlins to make the playoffs. In an ideal scenario, the Marlins are a game up on both the Cubs and Diamondbacks or Cubs and Reds or Diamondbacks and Reds or some combo. And the game doesn't matter because they can end up tied and they will have clinched on Saturday. Saturday is the day we clinched, day before the end of the regular season. Great day to clinch because you can come in completely tired, exhausted, and groggy and know that you've got a game where it really does not matter. So I'm pretty worked up about this whole tarp thing. How can you be that inept? It is such a bad look for the Mets organization. I wonder whether Steve Cohn's even embarrassed by it. They haven't said a word. Where's the comments? Billy Epler not available to the media? Is he sulking because he lost his job to David Stearns? I would never have gotten away with that. The media, even in Miami, forget the New York media, the Miami media never would have allowed me to get away without a comment if something like that had happened. Maybe I missed it. Maybe I missed it. When you run a sports team, own a sports team, president, general manager, president of baseball operations. You are responsible for what is a very public asset. Everyone wants to know everything that's going on. Your job is to give people as little as possible while making it feel like they're getting more than they ever thought they would get. It is an interesting line when you are in sports, sports business, because you're constantly dealing with PR issues and constantly thinking about ways to increase your revenue, to increase your standing in the community, and to be loved. And it's really hard when you're an owner to be loved. 
I think who was the owner? We covered it last week, Coca. There was an owner who said, uh, oh, it was James Dolan who said the best way to be loved is to croak. Maybe he's right. A big article was written by uh, an ESPN by Shelbourne about Josh Harris. I want to talk about Josh Harris for a moment. He's the new owner of the Washington Commanders. And her first, it's Ramona Shelbourne. Thank you, Coca. I was going to say Ramon, and I knew that was not right. Ramona Shelbourne. An outstanding article, ESPN, about Josh Harris and his quest and life as an owner, what he did before that. It's a very long article. Let me sum it up for you in the following way. Josh Harris made a lot of money on Wall Street. Josh Harris said, hey, David, who happens to be a great guy, David Blitzer, another financier. Hey, David, let's buy some sports teams. Let's start with the Philadelphia 76ers. This is going to be awesome. They lose $25 million a year, but we love them. We're big fans. When you're a fan of something and you can buy it, how great is that? It's like Nicolas Cage buying another snake or another island. Hey, I like that. I'll take it. Oh, no, I'm bankrupt. Now, the numbers are quite different with Josh Harris when you're worth billions and billions of dollars and you buy an asset, whether it's a piece of art or a team, you're probably not going to go bankrupt unless you're really, really bad at what you do. And it's hard to become a billionaire if you're bad at what you do. So Josh Harris and David Blitzer buy the Philadelphia 76ers. They buy the New Jersey Devils. They buy Crystal Palace. They don't win. They don't win. They don't win. They trust the process. They don't win. They've got PR issues. They don't win. They've got to deal with players who are unhappy. They don't win. They've got to deal with teams that stink and can be relegated. Don't win. And they said, you know, I think we should get into the NFL. Let's become good friends with Danny Boy and see if we can't buy the Washington Commanders as soon as he's forced to sell. $6.05 billion later, and Josh Harris is the new owner of the Commanders. And what's fascinating about the story of Josh Harris is that he is becoming more and more public. He is enjoying being in front. He's trying to figure out how to make it work, both financially and from a public relations standpoint. And he believes that because of his ownership of other teams, that he is in a unique position to have almost used those teams as training wheels for the final curtain of the NFL, thinking that the NFL is the granddaddy of all sports leagues. And he's not wrong. And investing $6 billion in a team, understanding that your return on investment for that investment, for that team, cannot rival what you've done in your other life, even with your other sports teams. The Philadelphia 76ers were bought for two to three hundred million dollars, call it two hundred and eighty million dollars. They'd probably be worth a couple billion dollars at least right now. Do you think there's a scenario under which the commanders would be worth, I don't know, sixty billion dollars? Very unlikely in his lifetime or mine or yours. So then you start telling yourself that there's other reasons you're going to do this. And it is the old, we want to bring a championship to our great fans. We want to do right by them. We get the feeling of what it was like as a child to be a fan, and we want to bring memories and all of the same things that we all say. It's the honeymoon period, and honeymoons, by definition, don't last forever. So Josh Harris is going on this PR tour. Remember, he did the interview with Joe Buck and Troy Aikman in the first game where he had the awkward handshake. And it wasn't a handshake, but it was a handshake. And now he allows this article. But there's one bit in there that was very interesting to me that will not get enough attention. And on this show, we try to tell you what goes on in commissioner's offices, inside the boardroom with ownership groups. Do you remember the guy, Michael Rubin? Michael Rubin is the owner and founder of Fanatics. 
yeah, they're trying to take over the world, trying to become Amazon. Wait, just you wait. That is his goal is to be Amazon. You can't buy toaster ovens yet, but you can certainly bet sports and you can buy stuff, trading cards, all sorts of things. He used to be a partner in the 76ers with Blitzer and Harris. He had to sell his stake in the Sixers because he really wanted to get into gambling. But how did he join that ownership group with the Sixers? Michael Rubin has said that he joined the group because David Stern, the commissioner at the time, who knew Michael, said, Michael, I thought about this. You need to go in and be a real partner, is how Michael Rubin recalls this happening. And Michael Rubin said, why? And David Stern said, because if anything goes wrong, you work for effing me and I can control you. And so you're effing doing this because I need someone in this group that I control. Let that marinate for one second, if you don't mind. David Stern is not the only commissioner who operates that way. Bud Selig, Rob Manfred, Roger Goodell, David Stern, Adam Silver, Paul Tagliabu, you name it, Gary Bettman. The reason why commissioners want to control who sits in the owner's box is because the owners are the ones who actually control the commissioner. And if you choose an owner the way Bud Selig chose Mark Walter, Guggenheim Partners, John Henry, Fenway Sports Group. In theory, that owner is beholden to you because you allowed him in the room where it happens. You allowed him to follow his childhood dream and own a team. Which is why when owners who are chosen by commissioners turn on those commissioners, it becomes a really big deal. The number one example of that is John Henry of the Red Sox. You won't read much about this. But the problem within baseball that they have with John is that when John Henry owned the Marlins, he was a small market hawk is what he was called, meaning he was very much fighting for the rights of low revenue small market teams. In 2002, as part of the franchise swap, John Henry went and got the Red Sox, sold the Marlins and bought the Red Sox. In a matter of under 369 days, John Henry could have given one crap about small market teams. The thought was put John Henry in Boston, bring a small market mentality to a large market behemoth who used to be a bully siding with the Yankees and get the Red Sox on the side of the low revenue teams, therefore making it easier to have a cohesive league with less economic disparity. What a brilliant move, except John turned on Bud Selig, turned on Rob Manford, and he is now a large market guy who cares less about small markets and only does things that benefit the large market teams. So there is a level of backfire that can happen, but in that article, when they talk about David Stern wanting control of an ownership group, that's real. That happens. So the behind the scenes machinations, when groups are bidding for a team and you think, oh, it's just numbers. Part of the business calculation is also the personality and the relationship. Speaking of personalities and relationships, the relationship between Colin Kaepernick and the NFL is not very good. I don't think we need to relitigate the kneeling situation. I don't think we need to discuss any further whether or not Colin Kaepernick is ever going to be in the NFL again. Colin Kaepernick is sort of where Barry Bonds is. The problem is that Colin Kaepernick won't go away. And I'm talking about a problem from the NFL standpoint, not from societal standpoint, not from what's right. Is it right that Kaepernick never got another chance? No. Is it understandable? Yes. Don't forget to apply 
the test that we've discussed on previous episodes of Nothing Personal. You have to imagine the signing press conference. What are you going to say when you sign the player? And then how much a distraction will it be once the red light goes off on the opening press conference? And how much will your other players and staff have to deal with the fallout of the decision you make? But to Colin Kaepernick's credit, he stayed in shape, never misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And it happened again yesterday. J. Cole, if you know his music, very famous rapper, released after getting permission from Kaepernick himself, released on his Instagram, and he's got quite a few followers, a letter that Colin Kaepernick wrote to Joe Douglas, the GM of the Jets. Now, let me explain how strange this is. In 18 years, I got zero letters from a player asking to be signed. Many, many unsolicited letters from agents. Never directly from a player. Colin Kaepernick wrote a two-page letter to Joe Douglas, starting with, I hope this letter finds you in great spirits. Weird. You know, when you're sending like a condolence card, and Aaron Rodgers didn't die, so I don't want to say that. But when you're sending a condolence letter, or when you're sending someone to someone who's, whose business just went bankrupt, or who didn't get the job they wanted, or who didn't get a contract they wanted, You don't start with, hey, I hope this letter finds you in great spirits. No, it doesn't. I'm grumpy and angry. I'm writing, of course, Colin said, in response to the unfortunate loss of Aaron Rodgers. You know, I could quibble with how that's framed because he didn't die, but he was lost for the season, maybe. I know the aspirations this season were and still are to win a championship. Aspirations. Anyone remember the word of the day from yesterday? Aspiration. Where are you going with this, Colin? The Hall of Fame-sized hole will need to be filled as best as possible. As of right now, Zach Wilson is charged with that task, and I wish him and the rest of the team the best moving forward. Why are you writing this letter? Here's a little little piece of advice when you're sending a cover letter or when you're writing a letter or having a conversation with somebody. Get to it. People generally read the first paragraph and the last paragraph of an article of a letter. They skim the rest and try to put the pieces together of what's in there. That's how reading comprehension mostly works. What are you asking for here, Colin? Because I feel like you're about to ask for a job. I'm not interested in your scouting report of Zach Wilson or how much you think Zach Wilson is good or not good. I'm not interested in whether or not you think I'm in a good mood, bad mood, or whether or not my spirits are high. Or that you need to tell me that we have depth issues at quarterback. And this is before Marcus Simeon was signed yesterday by the Jets. He then goes on to say, here's the ask. I would be honored and extremely grateful for the opportunity to come in and lead the practice squad. I would do this with the sole mission of getting your defense ready each week. What? Colin, I don't know who's advising you. I don't know who your agents are. It's like when you want to fire your manager and you bring in a bench coach who the manager knows is not really the choice of the manager and that the bench coach is going to replace the manager as soon as you lose three games in a row to the Mets. Or it's like bringing in a star player who's got two weeks left of an injury, knowing that you who are playing instead of the star player are no longer going to play as soon as the person who was just signed is ready to go. Do you think that Zach Wilson or the rest of the Jets players wouldn't look at the Colin Kaepernick signing, putting him on the practice squad as him being there, overshadowing Zach Wilson 
and being the main story, not just because of his past and the kneeling, but because of a quarterback of that caliber being signed to only the practice squad as a way to show off his skills and his readiness and the fact that he works out 15 hours a week, 5 to 8 a.m., five days a week, top physical shape for six years. What part of that plan did you think was going to work exactly? Was it writing the letter that you thought would work? Was it releasing the letter that you thought would work? Or worse yet, was it what was suggested in the letter that you thought would work? Because all three of them are tied for no chance toilet pants. You think the Jets are going to be bullied into putting you on the practice squad because you released a letter publicly? Do you think the Jets didn't realize you were available when they signed Trevor Simeon? It's Trevor, not Marcus. Sorry. My mind was with the Rangers. Certainly not my heart. That's in San Francisco. Did you actually think that you were giving Joe Douglas new information? Oh, we totally forgot the Kaepernick's available. Thank you so much. Now that we got the letter, we realize it. You know what? Let's bring him in. It's laughable. And here's the last thing before we go to break. When you're making a suggestion of something that you want to do that benefits you, it's okay to admit it, but don't pretend you're doing it out of the kindness of your heart. Inside the letter, he continues to say that signing me would allow you guys as an organization to take a real look at where I am at football-wise in game-like situations against an elite defense while also not putting any competitive pressure on Zach. I understand the importance of keeping him confident and focused as the number one quarterback. And I would only look to boost that confidence in any interactions that we may have. Don't tell somebody that you are able to do something and that your purpose is something when it's not because it's transparent. You're not trying to get on the practice squad. You're not there to mentor Zach Wilson. You want to be a quarterback in the NFL again. We know it. You know it. I dig it. I get it. I'm good with it. Say it. I would have more respect for this letter if Kaepernick had written. I still can't understand why I was never given a chance. And while I understand that Woody Johnson, the owner of the Jets, had a certain view of what I did and the position I took. I do feel that it was all a big misunderstanding. And I know that I can help your team as your quarterback because I'm better than anything you have. Here's my number. Let me know if you want to win. Love, Colin. I think that would have worked better. All right, let's take a break. We come back. We're going to review an outstanding movie with Ben Platt. And then we're going to talk about what's going on with Lillard, the Blazers, and the Heat. I've got a big update for you. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. We are here live 8 a.m. every day. Nothing Personal with David Sampson, YouTube channel. Don't forget to go to our website, davidsampsonpodcast.com. I've sent a bunch of merch out to people who donated over $250 to the Brett Parker, Michael J. Fox charity for the run that we did this past weekend. Thank you for that. Thanks for all the merch and the pictures. I got Coke. I forgot to tell you. I got a funny picture of someone in a horse hockey shirt. Someone that you wouldn't imagine would be wearing a horse hockey shirt. It was the demographic that is not that is not our number one demographic but I love it. I want, I want people of all ages. I love that in your eighties, you are listening and watching nothing personal, walking around with a horse hockey shirt. That makes me smile. I watch a movie every day and I am unabashedly a musical theater person. And I don't say geek. I don't say nerd. When I run on my playlist, I've got Broadway show tunes. 
I listen to them in the car. I have a playlist called DPS Relax, DPS Run, DPS Car. I have different playlists for different things that I'm doing. And there's Broadway show tunes everywhere. I love acting. I can't sing, but I love attending and engaging with musical theater. There's a new movie out called Theater Camp. Ben Platt from Dear Evan Hansen is in the movie. Molly Gordon, who is incredibly talented, you may have seen her in Booksmart and various other places, is in the movie. Jimmy Tatro is in the movie, who I had not heard of, I admit it. There's a lot of holes in my knowledge of current day influencers. He's in this movie. The movie is about people who are counselors at a theater camp. And it's like a documentary. It's almost like the Spinal Tap documentaries, the Best in Show documentaries. It's almost like a spoof documentary, except it's a movie and it's not really a documentary. As Coca said pregame, they call it a mockumentary. I didn't find it anything other than an incredibly funny movie because A, I went to camp, B, I love musical theater. C, if you don't like either of those, I still want you to give the movie a chance because it's never too late to broaden your horizons. It's never too late to admit that you like something even when you don't want to. Now, grant you, I had a lie about listening to 101.5 as a child and pretend I listened to 95.5 PLJ or 100.3 Z100 when in fact I liked light music. I liked Air Supply because you're every woman in the world to me. I liked that kind of music. I always did. But with peer pressure, I had to pretend that I was into ACDC. So I understand that some of you may be reticent to acknowledge your love of Ben Platt and theater. But trust me, you'll like it. Theater camp. Thank you, Ben Platt. Molly Gordon, outstanding. All right. Do you know the MLB, the MLB, cut that, Coca. Let's start that again. Let's go from the end of the review. Molly Gordon, outstanding. Do you know on October 3rd, Major League Baseball playoffs begin? Do you know what else is October 3rd? The opening of NBA training camp. All I keep thinking about is Jokic saying, oh my God, we got to start again. This is ridiculous. We just won the title. Now we have to push the boulder back up the hill. And for 31 teams or 29 teams, depending on the league, the boulder crashes down on them. They get ripped into a thousand pieces. They take a couple months off. They put it all together and push the boulder back up the hill, trying to do it again. It's insanity. And if you win the title, your boulder doesn't crush you, but still you walk it down to the bottom of the hill, hand in hand, side by side, and then you got to start pushing the boulder back up the hill. One of the biggest stories of the offseason has been Damian Lillard and his player empowerment move saying that if I play next season where I'm only going to make $50 million, I'm only going to do it for the Miami Heat. If I'm in training camp, it's going to be for the Heat or the Trailblazers. Don't you trade me somewhere else because I'm never playing for anyone but those two teams. Adam Silver had to step up and say, actually, you better play wherever you are contracted to play. The Heat and the Blazers have not been able to get a trade worked out, much like the Clippers and the Sixers for Harden. I would like to take you behind the scenes of a trade call that is going on currently between Pat Riley and Joe Cronin. Pat Riley is in charge of the Heat. Joe Cronin is in charge of the Trailblazers. The phone rings. The phone rings. Cook. What? Metalark. Anybody. The phone rings. Sound? Nope. I guess it's not our time here, Coca. Hey, Joe, it's Pat. How we doing? Hey, Joe, you, you got to make this trade now. We've got to figure this out. We've been going back and forth the entire summer. We've told you that we'll give you Tyler Hero. We give a couple first round draft picks. You're not going to get a better trade anywhere. And you don't want an unhappy player. 
These are how trade conversations actually go. You don't want an unhappy player with you, do you? Joe Cronin says, I'm not going to be ruled by the player. Make me an offer that I can, in good conscience, bring to ownership. Jody Allen is my owner. Not Paul anymore. It's Jody Allen. I've got to go to Jody and say, I sign off on this as a basketball trade, not as a fire sale because we have an unhappy player. Pat said he's 33 years old. Joe, he's 33. You gave him an extension. He's owed almost $200 million. What are we talking about here? You want an extra first round pick? I can't get it to you. The rules are I'd have to make a whole nother trade. I have to redo a past trade to try to get a third first round pick available. I can't do it. You want another one of my players? I'll do it. But that's it. Pat, I'll be back to you. No, Joe, this is it. This is the final call. Pat, you know it's not the final call. There's no such thing as a final call. Joe, we have training camp October 3rd. We used to use deadlines like this all the time. We've got to get our roster set by spring training. It's such horse hockey. You don't need your roster set by spring training at all. You don't even need your roster set by opening day. You make a trade whenever you want. In any case, the October 3rd deadline that's being written about, it's not a real deadline. It's not adding leverage to one side or the other. It's not like Joe Cronin is waking up today calling Pat Riley and saying, Pat, you know, you've really done a great job. We're going to blink right now. They haven't blinked, blunk, blinked, blanked since July. Why now? When I have a trade that I want to have happen and the GMs can't make it happen, I would get involved at the president's level. Sometimes we get the owners involved. And I was imagining Mickey Arison getting involved in this trade, having a conversation with Jody Allen. Mickey Arison calls Jody Allen, says, Jody, you know, we really should have left this to Pat and Joe, but you really don't want this type of attention on your team. As it is, you've held on to the Blazers longer than you should have, according to what Paul wanted. As it is, the Blazers, you've put them in a position where they're not going to win with Lillard anyway. Why not just let Joe start over, get some picks from us, and let's go? Jody says, Mickey, wh why are you even bothering to call me? Well, I'm calling because Pat and Joe can't get it done. And I didn't want to authorize Pat to do this himself, but I'm willing to throw in a free seven-day Caribbean cruise for you and yours. Family reunion type stuff. Um, Mickey, I can buy your company. I think I'll pass. I wonder what's going to happen. You're going to see leaks. The, the Raptors are now rumored to be in the best position to get Lillard in a trade. Then Lillard will have to let out that he won't play in Toronto just like Leonard wouldn't, but then he didn't want a title. You're going to see leverage try to be manufactured because of the calendar. It's not going to work. Where does this end? And this is the news I wanted to give to all Miami fans. Damian Lillard is not being traded to the Heat by October 3rd. The Heat will not open training camp with Lillard, and you've just got to wrap your arms around that, however upset that makes you. As a matter of fact, I'm willing to make that an official wait to see. Lillard will not be traded to the Heat by October 3rd. Book that, Coca. We'll revisit that on October 3rd, or if he gets traded before. Nothing personal pick of the day. Sponsored by, insert company name here. Well, oh, I get it. We don't have the sponsor yet. Got it. Hello, DraftKings. We are available for your sponsorship opportunity for this nothing personal pick of the day, where we had the Diamondbacks over the White Sox in what should be and was the easiest pick we've had this year. We are 130 and 134. Ugh. I hate having to acknowledge how bad it's been. Well, there's a big game in New York today, and you think I'm going to pick the Mets and Marlins. I'm going over to the other side. I'm going to the Yankees and the Blue Jays. The game is in Ontario and Toronto. It's Garrett Cole's last start. The New York Yankees are last year's 
Miami Marlins. The Yankees are going to have a Cy Young Award winner on a team that didn't make the playoffs. Aaron Judge, the biggest offseason free agent signing where we told you, go find the episode. Bringing Aaron Judge back does not make the Yankees better. At best, it keeps them the same, but he's a year older and you're paying him more. That roster is aging, decrepit, and signing Rodon, not enough, not necessary, and a total overpay. The Yankees will not make the playoffs. This is the first time in 30 years that neither the Red Sox or the Cardinals are in the playoffs. It is such a bizarre year in Major League Baseball. It is a perfect storm for all owners, most owners, and the commissioner. Garrett Cole winning the Cy Young, and he will solidify it the way Blake Snell did the other day when they beat the Blue Jays. Okay, I had a thought that I wanted to bring up as we have still have four minutes to go before this show ends. And then at 9 a.m., I'll be live on the Levitard YouTube channel doing the local hour there. I was thinking more about Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. And I was thinking about the business side of that relationship. And I was thinking about the attention that Kelsey's now getting. You're seeing numbers everywhere. Jersey sales spike by 400%. It's just a dream. 24 million people watched that Bears Chiefs game. The demographics, women, girls, everybody watching the NFL. It's almost like they paid Taylor Swift because they wanted to keep thumbing down the other leagues. It's the greatest PR campaign that you don't have to buy. And you wonder why, whenever you're watching a sporting event, that they cut two celebrities in the crowd. Because they want to be cool. They want you to think it's cool to be at the game or to be a fan of the game or to be watching the game. And the level of cool of Taylor Swift is another level of cool. And if you can be cool in a different demographic, now that's a relationship worth discussing. Am I saying that they manufactured the date between Swift and Kelsey? Maybe. Am I saying that there was absolute planning by everybody regarding what happened with Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey? Yes, I am. This stuff doesn't happen by accident. They didn't meet on Tinder. It's an entire storyline. There's an arc. Does any of this sound familiar? Have you ever seen a relationship that was put together, manufactured, served its purpose, and then before you knew it, disappeared? Think of it like a Kardashian husband. It's part of the season, and then it's done. But when it's part of the season, you get a lot of great attention, you get a bump, you get to sell that bump, and you get to make money from that bump. One of my favorite songs in, in the studio in New York, Behind My Right Shoulder, is an album by Rush. There's a song called Limelight. All the world's indeed a stage, and we are merely players, performers and portrayers, each another's audience outside the gilded cage. The cameras are always rolling. Everybody's paying attention. Everybody wants somebody to watch them. Everybody wants to benefit from that somebody's time, energy, resources. The limelight is something that when you seek it and you find it, and you know how to monetize it, and you choose that as your life, as your career, as your passion, when you hit it right, it's not anything other than the best feeling in the world. What the NFL is experienced now, what they're experiencing now with Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey, 
the reality TV side of this moment. What Jason and Travis are experiencing with their fame, with the documentary, with their podcast, all of it is their moment now. And believe me, like a kidney stone, it will pass. It's just business. This is nothing personal.